Hi, I'm Zach. Today I did something strange and unexpected. I got a cryptocurrency wallet and logged into a video game called The Sandbox to see what all the fuss was about. I heard a story that the rapper Snoop Dogg was buying up virtual property in the game and needed to see what was going on for myself. Snoop recently bought Death Row Records. Names like Eminem, Dr. Dre, 50 Cent all ride on that label, including Snoop. And he has his sights set on creating the next evolution of the music business in the cyberverse. Snoop Dogg currently has $17 million worth of non-fungible tokens, or NFTs, in his digital wallet. It's a collection of influential digital art that is now owned by Snoop. And that ownership is confirmed through blockchain technology. Snoop has even released his own intellectual property, or IP for short, as NFTs. And around the time of his Super Bowl performance, raised something around $4 million so far by selling little digital images of himself, NFTs, for about $1,900 a piece and rising. We're living in a fast world. Bitcoin is now an official currency alongside the US dollar in El Salvador. This blockchain thing is mainstream and healthy. I'm not investing anytime soon because blockchain technology itself has a lot of environmental problems, it uses a lot of electricity, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. But I am intrigued. I've been chatting with different video game developer friends of mine, and blockchain is making its way into our entertainment spheres, and we're all talking about it. My next guest is a video game development director from Electronic Arts, or EA one of the mega global video game companies. I met Andrew Knight through a game we had both worked on called The Long Dark by Hinterland. Gaming is a 180 billion plus dollar industry right now and it's not slowing down. So let's keep our fire hot with one of the veterans in the business and welcome Andrew Knight, Controlled Chaos. I'm Zach White and this is The Ranger Cabin. Yeah, I've always been interested in, in games ever since I was little. You know, the, the candies and saving up my money to buy memory upgrades so I could play this new game. You know, I have a vivid memory of my, my dad, who was not a computer savvy person, trying to put in a memory chip and then bending the pin. And like my life was over. I like started crying. And he's like, no, wait, 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 I think I got it. And he strained it out and it worked. And yeah, so it's, it's always been a big part of my life you know, sneaking down at night on the dial-ups and putting, like, the pillow over the modem so you don't hear the screeching noise and waking up the parents just so I could go into these BBSs and, and talk to these people around the world. And um, my parents always telling me not to spend my money on games or go to the arcade. And I'd like to say, like, well, look at me now. <laughs> like, yeah, and then I, I um, went to art school because I, I kind of, so back then, like your first entry into games was either being a programmer or being an artist. Because it was very, like as an artist back then in, in game, game development, you had to kind of do everything. Like make the art, make the textures, light it, do the levels. And, um, and I, I felt like art college was the, the best way forward. My first application to a game company here was rejected <laughs> so that was a hit of a hit to my ego so i went back to england where in england they view training on the job with more of a positive light because you have an option of going into trades or a levels so you actually have like 16 year olds going into the, the work industry and learning a trade there or you go to a levels and get ready for university so going there i actually got a job at pinewood studios and one of my first real projects was working on charlie and the chocolate factory uh, the Johnny Depp, uh, Tim Burton version, just doing some 3D art for that. And when I came back to Canada, they're like, okay, you're good enough. And I started uh, at Bioware back in Edmonton because that's where my, my family was. And from there, it was just a, a journey of, of moving around to different companies. 
my very, very supportive and understanding wife with all these moves, going from Edmonton to Vancouver to Montreal to Vancouver to Australia <laughs> to Vancouver Island. What a rock star. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing. But now we're back in Comox Valley. She's, she's put her foot down. She got a dog. <laughs> she started <laughs> buying stuff to anchor herself. She's like, I'm never moving again. So now, yeah, now I'm working from home for Electronic Arts. And uh, yeah, it's been a bit nice. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm on the, the management side now. I've spent almost 20 years making games in various companies. And I've uh, started my career mostly doing art on the environment side and lighting side. And uh, yeah, in the past five or so years, moved more into team management. Um, I have enough experience that studios are looking towards... Uh, uh, finding people that have the ability to deliver a product rather than do specific art within that product. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> so, yeah, so like uh, creating a, a video game is, is very complicated, very costly. And, you know, you, you're looking at a $70 million budget for a lot of AAA games. Wow. So you, you need um, a vast array, array of uh, talent in your, in your team and um, people to manage that talent in terms of are they, are they doing, you know, the right uh, action items at the right time? You know, what are the deliverables? You know, or are there dependencies between different departments? And, yeah, it just takes uh, a lot of team management to, to make sure everyone's driving towards that similar goal. So it's really exciting to have you here. We met, man, I can't even remember really remember it was maybe seven years seven years ago yeah six years ago yeah, yeah so you moved to the valley we had both worked on the long dark title i worked on the kickstarter mm -hmm. um you came over to do some modeling yeah i was doing uh entire area of the the game and that yeah that was about for about six months yeah so that was with hinterland games and they were a company that started close by to where um, we live currently mm -hmm. and have since moved most of their operation, I think, to Vancouver, yeah. Gastown. And um, yeah, really cool. Uh, very successful as far as I can tell on the outside. And uh, Raf, uh, shout out to him because he recently donated, I think, 125 grand to the cause in Ukraine. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Which is incredible. And uh, that, uh, just for context, if you're listening to this in the future, Russia has invaded Ukraine. There's all that going on right now. It brings a lot, actually, to what I want to discuss today, which is things like blockchain, NFTs, Everything is cyber, uh, this and that. A lot of the gaming industry is moving into the cyberspace. And I am confused by it still. But I know it's very important. This idea of decentralized banking, decentralized currency, everything is becoming kind of uncontrolled. And for sure in the, in the Russia is, is probably right into it, having Putin, having his assets frozen all over the world, the SWIFT system that controls kind of international sales and trade between countries has blocked out Russia. So they're not able to transfer funds. Blockchain all of a sudden looks like a real thing that's going to be here forever. And I know I'm way behind the eight ball on this. Yeah, I mean, blockchain, no, no, it, it became mainstream, you know, when Bitcoin started rising up in, in price. Sure. And um, people view Bitcoin now as more like the, the gold standard. It's like you can't, you can't really do much with Bitcoin itself other than transfer it to something else on the blockchain that you can, you can market. So it's like you wouldn't go into a grocery store with a gold coin and say like, hey, I want to buy some groceries you would take that gold coin to a bank and then change that for money. So a lot of a lot of the transactions now happen on Ethereum, which is a currency on blockchain. And people usually move between Bitcoin and Ethereum and other altcoins. And everything is everything is tied to that Bitcoin price. If Bitcoin goes down, everything else goes down. It's like a Oh, is that it's right? Like a, yeah, a gold standard. So okay. So yeah, I mean it's it's creeping into all aspects of life. There's a case on right now against the SEC in, in the U.S. against Ripple. They uh, do XRP coin 
and uh, their goal is to replace the Swift system because the Swift is old and archaic and it takes a long time. And they're saying you could do this much easier on the blockchain. So they built this, this system out using XRP, but now they're in a, a current legal battle saying, is it, is it a currency? Is it a security? What is it? So yeah, that's still to be resolved in terms of the financial side. A lot of startups are aiming towards the NFT, non-fungible tokens. And, you know, that kicked off with uh, the artist uh, Beeple when he released a massive uh, auction, I think on Christie's. I can't remember the auction name. Yeah, that's that sold probably like, one of the bigger auction yeah, houses. Yeah, and it sold for tens of millions of dollars from his life work, so to speak. Okay. And that kind of got everyone's attention saying like, okay, this is, this is digital art. And it raised the question around what's the difference between a painting on a canvas and someone who paints in Photoshop other than the ability to easily copy it. Like you can't go into the Louvre and take a photo of Mona Lisa very well and then say like, I got the Mona Lisa. So it comes into a problem where anyone can download that JPEG and say like, oh, well, I have now a copy of this NFT. So it really um, tries to solve the, the issue of ownership, like who owns that art piece like if someone sells you something in real life you own it if someone sells you a digital piece do you do you own it because anyone can take a copy of it so easily so right so you could copy the image yeah. but you don't own it well yeah again like the it's it's still in its infancy in, in terms of how the the blockchain and nfts work because again even with nfts you don't you don't actually own the image, you own a link to the image that's stored on a server that you don't own. So anyone, if that server changes hands, they could change the link, uh, the image that that link is pointing to, and it could be anything. So again, it, it goes, around, goes around ownership. Like you, okay, you own that, that map to that item, and everyone can see you own that map to the item, but the item doesn't actually exist on, in, in your possession unless you have something like what, again, what Beeple does is he sends out physical copies of his artwork in a glass case and, and that has a, a physical store of that image. So It's such a confusing concept at first, but then you think, everything is built on nothing uh, mm -hmm. as far as like money is just a concept and ideas of NFTs and the NBA has been really pushing. I think they were a very early adopter as a, an association. They've been creating NFTs out of their video clips of like mm -hmm. Michael Jordan winning. Oh know, yeah. I went on to CNN and I saw own this article of this story as an NFT and like everyone's trying to jump into it and there is a bit of like a, I feel like a gold rush right now. Right. And I don't know how it will play out. Maybe in 10 years it will take over as the new norm. Maybe it will fizzle out and something else will replace it. It's it, right now. It kind of reminds me of like the dot com boom. And right. Like right. There That's that, in 94. Yeah, yeah. 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 Back in, back in the mid late nineties. And you know, and the dot com just so people know, when everyone was trying to acquire kind of a dot com name, yeah, and everything then, was moving to the web, and everyone felt like they had to have this this presence online, and they were paying a lot of money to get this presence online. But then they, it kind of failed because you needed a lot of infrastructure to support your online presence. Like you can't just have a website with no user experience, and that's where a lot of companies that are offering these services ended up crashing because, like, yeah, you have a cool site, but what's the use of it if I can't? Like, because this is when, you know, Amazon was still in, in its infancy as well, right? So That's right. that was a very new concept of I can order whatever I want online and it'll come to my door. I remember at that time, if you knew like CSS or anything like that, you were like, a you god. Were, you're a gold, right? Yeah. And suddenly that just dropped all of a sudden. And, and everybody was good at like foosball and ping pong. Because oh, yeah. I remember <laughs> that was like the main, like yeah, any yeah. news story you saw, it was like, oh, these dot com companies. Yeah, yeah, you'd have like these, you know, beanbag chairs and bright colors and rounded, like no corners and open space. And like, look how cool we are. And we're a, we're a dot com industry. And <laughs> the, the only difference now, I think, with NFTs is that 
as being run by people in their homes. Like there are right. no big offices around that. So you don't have that infrastructure and that cost associated with starting up these companies. Yeah, I feel like it is here to stay. I already feel that. Mm. Like I think I, I agree with your analogy of the gold rush and this is happening in a way that's kind of uncontrolled and the space is like really scary. I feel like there will always be an element of this. I think it's yeah. technology that will stay. Yeah, the technology I think is is interesting. You know, there's a lot of sketchy stuff going on as well, like a lot of cash grabs that you have to be careful for, especially with these new, like one of one, 8,000 generative art pieces that, you know, the board at your club made popular. And there have been a few others that have ridden that wave up. But now you, you go on into the NFT space and there's thousands of them. And people are literally dumping their money into these, hoping that it will increase, an increase in a rate that would make um, staunchest of hedge fund managers in Wall Street blush in terms of what they expect out of their return and the, the time. So that is what a lot of big companies are looking at and taking caution against is being caught up in the uncertainty around the average person investing into it like a stock market when it's not regulated like a stock market. And there's a lot of interesting things happening as well. Like I think of like Pokemon cards. I mean, I've even heard of people minting NFTs off property they don't even own. Oh yeah, in terms of like the- Like just full on scams, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And they, or they see something popular and then they just change it a little bit and release their own thing that's kind of like that, but a little bit different. And yeah, they, they will just go in and see who, who will buy it. I mean, there's, there was a big upset recently in, in, in the NFT space on this project called Pixelmon. And it's really a voxel based game based on the idea of Pokemon, but different creatures. And they raised from uh, a few trailers that they, they made that they got other artists to create for them. They made, they raised, I think $70 million dollars for this game that didn't exist. And then when they will, when they uh, revealed all of the NFT art based on these creatures, it was terrible. And it was, it was just churned through this, this filter where they, it looks like they just bought some low polygon art, put it through a voxel generator filter and, and put it on as NFT. And it was a huge upset recently in the NFT space where, where people were just, were just putting their money into this project and they didn't do any due diligence in terms of what was behind this. And some people were putting in thousands of dollars for this, this thing that they didn't know what it was. And, and suddenly you had this 21-year-old guy, I think he's in New Zealand, suddenly in charge of a budget that you can make Witcher 3 on. And it's a, it's a Pokemon shoot-off game that doesn't exist. So again, that's what I mean. Like this <laughs> NFC space is like a, <laughs> a gold, ma- gold rush where people don't know what they're buying. Yeah, They only just see like the success of a few individual NFTs and think, oh, this is my chance. And then 90% of them crash and burn. And a lot of people, I think, are going to get hurt because they, they just get caught up in their FOMO. Have you seen anything successful? Like, is there a pattern in what would make an NFT successful? And I'm not asking you to give advice here. I'm just, just curious as to the things I've heard, just to preface it a little bit. The idea that you would have a, a large group of people and then there's a release of something. So maybe somebody famous is doing it. Mm-hmm. Like the, yeah, a lot of famous like the, people. The are, Rock yeah, yeah. issues a, a picture of a barbell or a guy doing a little yeah. squat or something. A lot, then, of, a lot of famous people are in there. I mean, I think there was an article out recently that Steve Aoki. Um, yeah, wicked. He, he's, I think he went on records and he's made more money in NFTs than a lot of his recent music releases Interesting. because people want his brand. Same with, with uh, like Dead Mouse has, has very, very big in the NFT space and the crypto space. So yeah. And he has people, such a brilliant brand so that yeah, everybody yeah. just kind of wants a piece. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, a lot of 
a lot of those drops kind of promise you know exclusive access to things like maybe merchandise that you can buy that other people can't buy and it's almost like your your vip ticket in terms of getting more access to those people that you admire and you follow so again like using that that non-tangible nft space is really great for fans to to follow and, and get extra access as long as that that person or that company you invested in is transparent because a lot of a lot of people in the nft space you don't even know who they are like they haven't released their public information or identity and it allows them to just disappear so you know when you want to do due diligence like if you're going to look into an nft project you say like do i know who's making this you know can i actually see their you know linkedin profile can i see their Instagram account, do I know their name? Do I know what they look like and where they live? And a lot of people, because it's a gold rush, don't even think about that. They just kind of see dollar signs with what happened with a few select NFTs and want to get in. Yeah. So you, you just have to, yeah, do your due diligence and be careful with your with your money. I think it's interesting with the brand idea because I was thinking like Joel Zimmerman or Dead Mouse could release a picture of you know, his little mouse ears, mm-hmm. for example. And yeah, yeah. that might be the NFT. Oh, yeah, he has NFTs. All the- he has a generative NFT that has the mouse head. And when you mint it or when you create it, it creates different elements of oh. that mouse head. And then it says, okay, this is yours. It's unique to you and you own it. Kind of like with Board 8 Yacht Club, you own that generative picture of that ape and all its traits and it's your IP. You can do with it what you want. So, and again, but like, again, like the long-term utility of it is, is still in question. It's like, right. What do you do with it? Cause right now a lot of people are treating it as an investment vehicle and mm. it's, it gets tricky. I can see a lot of, a lot of, um, regulations coming up in the future around it. So uh, another big NFT space is the sandbox where they have a lot of corporate involvement. You, you have like the Smurfs in there, you have the walking dead in there. You know, you have Atari in there and a lot of these people are, are paying to put their brand out into this, this experience that people will, will play. So tell me about the landscape idea because it was like a second life video mm-hmm. game is kind of how I think of it. You would go into it like an immersive space and then there would be a store like Snoop Dogg, I remember. Yeah, it's yeah, really Snoop big Dogg's into it. There. Yeah, exactly. Can you explain that to me a little bit? Throughout the history of video games, I mean, there's always been real-world money involved in inside market of, of the game. Like, even going back to, like, World of Warcraft, like, the true biggest MMO after EverQuest, where it became so popular that you would have people who were living in Asia, where the, the cost of living was so cheap, going out and just farming gold coins in that game and so they could sell it for real money. Because people in the Western world or more developed countries say, okay, I want all this gold. I'm not going to play the game for 10 hours to get this amount. I'm just going to go and spend 20 bucks, right? And, and someone else will give it to me. I mean, it was never sanctioned by Blizzard, but that's just what happened because that was the market. And that was kind of like the first true inception of introducing real money into a, into a game. And from there, it's just expanded. Like The next big one I can think of is Team Fortress 2 from Valve where released cosmetics and hats and, and weapons and those were created by the community and they would get a cut of every time something that was was made. Like you would have teenagers suddenly making millions of dollars at the height of its popularity. Because they're selling like digital shoes that your character in the game yeah, could or, buy. Yeah, or a hat or whatever. And, right. And, you know, keeps going on with like uh, Counter-Strike, CSGO, like weapon skins. And the idea has always been there in terms of having real monetary value to your time and your assets in a game but that's always been constrained to the game platform itself and we'll see if it's successful or not but what nft land is trying to do i think is still having that monetary value in a game but delinking it from that game service itself so you could take that if you were playing this game for 10 years and you're done with it you could take everything that you've earned in that game and pass on to someone else independent of that game's platform. Right, like you could carry that NFT with you or that identity or that skin or whatever it might be. Is yeah. that kind of the concept yeah. behind it? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a pie in the sky feel of, 
of like, yeah, you know, this NFT could be used in other platforms, but that can only work when those platforms work together and develop together and communicate together. I think NFTs currently are just kind of picking up on the idea of of monetary value of your time spent in this game and how do you make it more accessible and de-link it from that game itself. So, yeah. Whoa, whoa. And it's so interesting to me that the whole thing is really based on your identity. Mm-hmm. Like the only reason you really buy an NFT is to say, yeah, I own something or I look a certain way and I can present myself mm-hmm. a certain way. It's a phenomenal amount of power behind people just trying to be individuals yeah yeah and it the the online online space and your online persona is completely separate it's a mask over top of your real life persona and growing up it was very much like a child's thing to do going back to like the bulletin boards and bbs's and and like having that online nickname and online persona and you know the adults back then would kind of roll their eyes about your your username and nowadays it's it's a common place. You would have 40 year olds, you know, going online with a completely different username. We've all grown up. Oh yeah. We've all grown <laughs> up. And, and, and now like, yeah, that it's just a commonplace thing for newer generations. Like my son is, is playing in Minecraft online and he has a username. I think it's going to be one of the first generations that growing up having the idea of protecting your identity online through this different persona. And that's where NFT come in is that those NFT uh, images can be your online persona and that has value. Now, is that value, is it going to appreciate over time? Is it going to be desirable for other people in five years? Who knows? Like it's, like I said, it's, it seems like a, a gold rush right now and no one really knows what it's going to evolve into, which is a lot of risk when you look at big businesses. Do a lot of thinking about this, and I have been doing a lot of thinking about this for like 20 years. The idea of everyone wanting to be famous and want to be known and mm-hmm. wanting to be individual and independent and be able to walk anywhere in the world and have your merits speak for you. But the flip side of the coin, of course, of being famous is that you have no anonymity and you can't move. You can't physically move when you're famous so without yeah. paparazzi and without people kind of like watching everything you do. And I couldn't solve that problem because I thought, ah, in the future, you know, with everyone wanting to be famous, everyone's got a social media account. Everyone's like, you know, going for likes. And if we kind of like take that into the future and what that might look like, mm-hmm. it's, all of a sudden a problem like that needs to be solved by anonymity. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a company that just made you anonymous and was kind of erased you from the web and allowed you to similar to, I guess, having an assistant who would do all your grocery shopping for you and all of your, you know, you would be able to go to the movie theater, for example, or pump your own gas or, you could do all those things without anybody knowing who you were. Yeah. But in fact, you had, so you had the fame, but you have the ability to move around the world anonymously. Yeah. I mean, again, uh, I think that's already here with, with this initial gold rush of NFTs. You have people that bought into these very specific IPs very early and they became millionaires. And they were just timing really down to it. It's like they identified that, hey, you know, this is, this might be something big and it took off. You can't, you can't really predict it, right? Just like you can't predict the stock market, you know, <laughs> you can, um, and when you have a, a rarity of this NFT, if only a few thousand exist and the demand is millions, then yeah, the price will increase because everyone wants to be part of that, that persona online like if you have this nft you're viewed as like oh i should follow this person because you know they're worth a lot of money now because the floor price is you know hundreds of thousands of dollars when it first came out it was hundreds of dollars so it allows them to have that anonymity and have that almost power behind having that fame and that money to to do what they want but no one really knows who they are and you can't really have that 
if you're in the public space and people know what you look like. And that's the that's what we're seeing as a different approach to celebrity followings is that you, you start following these people on Twitter that have these NFTs on their profile just for the sake of having a profile and people are listening to what they say because they they seem what the NFT space is, is going towards. Right. Is there a value over and above just owning it and being like, hey, I've got a gold watch, essentially? Yeah, I mean, again, yeah, like the the value is that, you know, people will pay attention to you just because you have this this NFT. Interesting. Yeah, and, you know, if you go onto Twitter and you have this NFT in your profile and, you know, you say like, yeah, I've got 50 of these, people are like, whoa, who is this guy? Right. He has the pushing power to move entire releases now if he wishes to. You know, he could sell two of those and then suddenly you know, take over in this, an entire NFT space if he desired. So again, it has that power. And I think the question is, is that power long lasting or not? Is the desire to have that long lasting? Exactly. It, it, it reminds me of like buying sneakers, yeah. you know, like it, everyone's like got a pair of Michael shoes. Jordans, right? <laughs> yeah. And you're just walking around in a pair of shoes and like, but there might be one person in the room who's like, oh, I know those shoes yeah, and yeah. I know how rare they are and I know they're really expensive. Yeah. Or like the you know, like $300 t-shirts. That, you know, right. They're just a white t-shirt, but people can understand what it is. Like I, like I grew up in England, which is where the accent came from. And I just remember going over there when I was in my 20s and I just took over a bunch of diesel jeans because that's just what I had. And they're expensive here, like about a hundred bucks or so. And my my cousin over there, the first thing she marked was, oh, diesel jeans, because they were so expensive over there and so out of reach to the common person. So, you know, yeah, like people will, will notice that, whatever it is. And I think NFTs are just another spin on that, that people will notice if they know what they're looking at. Yeah, and we love that as people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like wine, I'm thinking of, like yeah. you can have a $20 bottle of wine yeah. or you can have a $1,000 <laughs> bottle yeah. of wine. You live vicariously through people as well in terms of seeing what they're doing. You know, that's just human culture. Right. right. Yeah, we are definitely a communal <laughs> group. Yeah, exactly. We, yeah, we're always aspiring and yeah. desiring. Yeah, so so yeah, when it when it comes to, you know, the, the games industry space, and it, it's, it's very hesitant right now. I mean, they can attach themselves to other projects. I think what's holding them back is just the whole legality of it around laws and, and taxes and and everything and you know, yeah it's, it's just a it's very just, ethereal yeah. outside of any state yeah yeah so exactly. sandbox is this kind of landscape the cyber landscape right yeah yeah it's or the metaverse based. or yeah, whatever like, you call it like there's a lot of a lot of attention to the metaverse from facebook and microsoft and they're kind of vying for the the metaverse whatever that is you know people are trying to attach vr to to the metaverse when I don't think we're quite there yet. I mean... Definitely an interest. Yeah. And I why mean, is that, do you think? I don't think the interest in VR and the metaverse is quite there yet. You know, the metaverse came up from authors like Neil Stevenson, you know, Snow Crash and Neuromancer. And, and, but all of these worlds where this metaverse exists, Ready Player One, they all exist in this dystopian world where people don't have the freedom to do what they want. You know, and I think in Ready Player One, they live in their stacks, which is like stacks of shipping containers. So they escape to this metaverse because life sucks. Like the world isn't like that. So why would you want to strap on your headset for eight hours a day? You know, you're not escaping anything. You can go out, enjoy the sun, go out, have a coffee, you know, go in a park. Like it's it's not going to be any better than what you're experiencing. So I think I think the metaverse itself is is transforming more to that interconnectivity between either companies or experiences where you say, I have this asset in this game, I'm able to take it out and it's going to have value in these other platforms. And that needs a lot of co-development agreements between these corporations to allow that to happen. I think that's quite a ways off unless you have a platform that's attractive enough that you are attracting this brand to it and they're working with you to make sure their content can work between these platforms. And I think that's what the metaverse is now evolving into is more of a decentralized experience where you can take your experience and your investment and your money 
and apply that to, to multiple areas. But it's definitely not open source yet. I know there's a bit of a race to purchase all the gaming companies yeah, like yeah. Blizzard and like all these companies are being gobbled oh, yeah, up. Yeah, Microsoft, uh, yeah, purchased. By uh, Google Activision. or Microsoft or Facebook. Yeah. You know, Facebook doesn't have a lot of gaming no, I, in and it. again, like that was the heyday, right? If you go think back in terms of Farmville, pretty huge and died off and it's moved over to uh, mobile experiences where it's not constrained to that, that platform. So after we met, you went down to Australia. Yeah, two years. Yeah, to work there. What was that, what was that like? I mean, coming from gaming here, our industry, everyone's kind of familiar with it, I guess, mm-hmm. in Vancouver. Yeah, in Australia. What took you there? Oh, wow. in, yeah, I, so I, I was working at, at Microsoft for three years and I was mainly on contract and I had an offer from an uh, old friend I worked with in Montreal. And he said, like, hey, I have this studio down here. I need help, someone to help set up the external de- department and the process and help us ramp up. And they were, they were developing about four games on, on the mobile space. So, you know, I thought, hey, it would be a good adventure to go down and, and see Australia. And yeah, we really enjoyed it. Australia is interesting where it's, a, it's the only kind of Anglo cultural sphere in the Asian side of the world, right? So yeah, I, I worked down there at, at EA and yeah, mostly did mobile development. It's a very nonstop development. It's like a, a train that just keeps going. And anytime something breaks, you have to make sure the train keeps moving and kind of lean out the window and and fix the wheel and you can't go too slow <laughs> because nothing gets gone. You can't go too fast or you release a broken product. So there's, there's a lot of controlled chaos that happens in, in mobile development and any game development now is unless you're a, a true indie game developer, triple a dev is, is a, is a global effort. You are dealing with many artists around the world in these vendor studios that exist in Southeast Asia or in, in China or in Eastern Europe. And it takes a lot of organization to work on that 24 hour dev cycle. So mm. when, when work goes out to your artists that are in different time zones, you have to make sure that all the questions are answered, they have all the direction they need. And when it comes in, all the submission guidelines are correct and they understand all that process involved with making sure it appears in your game so they don't crash or be old or, or break the experience. So it's a lot of lot of management. So many moving parts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I was brought on to, to set that up and improve that process for the, the four titles there. That came from my experience working at, at Coalition in, in Vancouver, doing the same thing there, making sure our 55 external artists in Asia were always producing content when we were asleep. Know that the heart and soul of old AAA dev is uh, Jira, which is a project management platform, and Excel, because <laughs> that just gives you the information you need in terms of what everyone is doing. At a certain point in in your career, you're more valuable to the company with your experience on how to ship the project than it is for you to sit down and do the art. So we've talked about this before, about when you were in Australia and going to mobile gaming and this idea of like convenience gaming, like getting a little dopamine hit throughout Mm -hmm. the day. And then the idea of life isn't quite there yet for us to want to escape it all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might be in certain parts of the world, but what's fascinating is the population growth in some of these parts of the world where life isn't so great. And so is there a market targeted to uh, that? Or is am I totally wrong in thinking that India and China will be the biggest consumers of... China has exploded in the past 10 or so years. I've been to China a few times with my work. And like it's, it's amazing you see the progress. Like you go to Shanghai and it's like the Jetsons almost in terms of, you know, you compare it to some major cities in America you can see where the money went, <laughs> right? When they moved all that manufacturing to China, like that's, you go to Shanghai and like, well, this is what they built. Like it's, it's, it is a powerhouse now. And with a population of over a billion, you can't take that for granted in terms of their marketing power for individual interior focused uh, media. Like that they can pump out a lot of movies that aren't Hollywood grade 
but make as much as a Hollywood movie just because the demand is there because everyone wants to go to see it. The same with with uh, games. I mean, there was a point where, you know, in China, they, they didn't really know how to make AAA games, but we have relied on their talent for so long in the gaming industry that they have taken all of that knowledge and are now creating games that are equal, if not better, than what Western games have done. Because, again, like, they have that that manpower available to them and everyone there wants to be involved in that space so yeah i mean they have a a huge huge potential to upset you know how how digital media is is created in the future um uh, just media in general just media in general again like it it really depends like there's always gonna be a cultural barrier between certain consumer uh tastes but um there, there are a lot of, a lot of experiences that have a mass appeal. I, a good one is like Genshin Impact is a mobile game that was released, I think, a year ago, and it's made billions of dollars across the world, and it's it's free to play, and it's just a loot box system in terms of people buying the chance of getting an item, but because it's such a well crafted experience, and you could play it for thirty hours without encountering that system. It gets people drawn in and has a really good art. It has a really good story. You know, it has a really good gameplay experience. And and people are like, well, hey, I've played this for 30 hours. Yeah, I'll spend 10 bucks. And then as soon as that happens, it's like, yeah, gotcha, right? <laughs> and then it's like, oh, I'll spend another 10 bucks and another 10 bucks. And times that by millions of players, and you're just raking in the, the profits, right? Wow, so, what a slow burn as far as like a format to yeah, release. Yeah, 30 yeah. hours is a lot. Yeah, it is It is a huge amount. But it, again, like it's, it's very, it has that mass appeal and it just, yeah, it draws you in and you you want to see what this is and it has, you, you want to drive towards unlocking the, like the multiplayer aspect. So it's designed very cleverly. Being able to play it on mobile with virtually almost the same experiences on PC allows people to play it during their commute. A lot of people, especially in China, have very long commutes. Right. And I remember being on the, the bullet train from Beijing to Shanghai. And that thing goes like 200 some miles an hour. It's super fast. And you would just see people in their 20s just playing games and then pausing, going to something else, having to talk to someone else, go to something else, do some photo manipulation or social media stuff, go back to the game. And they're constantly multitasking on their phones like, they, they treat it as their computer and their entertainment devices all in one. Like it's similar into Australia as well. It has that influence. You do not need your wallet when you go out in the world. Everything is controlled by your phone. How to get into your apartment, you know, how to turn your car, how to pay for stuff, how to go to the bank, you know, go to the grocery store. It's all just on your phone. Anything that is, is usable on, on that device and has that mass appeal in China will take off. And that's the marketing power. And I think India is going to be next once they, they, they rise up. Unfortunately, I think India might take a while because they didn't have that influx of manufacturing money from America and North America that China did, you know, in the, in the 90s and, 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 and onwards. So I think it's pretty obvious that a lot of the industry dollars or will move away from kind of this platformer idea do you think and well, I mean, move into always, there will more of a, a mobile yeah there will always be a market for that i mean at, at the core the people who make games do so because it's their passion so there'll always be that figurehead that wants to make their idea mass effect started with a drawing on a bar napkin and turned into what it is today he had that idea and he had that passion and he drove it forward now, it's not going to make as much money as, you know, a Genshin Impact, but it has its market and it has its profitability. Let's talk about development for a minute because you you said something really funny to me a few years ago and we were sharing game ideas with each other. And then you said, yeah, nobody gives a shit about your game. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. Game idea, and yeah. And you said, what do you think about mine? And I said, <laughs> I, I don't even remember what it was. Yeah. And... I think that is such a funny thing. Like, what do you find when people ask you about gaming? What advice do you give them? Like, right now in history, I think it's the easiest time to make your own game just because of the tools are out there. Like, Unreal Engine 
you can go in there and you can make a gameplay experience with no programmers needed, no artists needed. You have the Unreal Store. You can download all your, your assets. You have visual blueprints. That's printing. like your trees and your... Yeah, yeah, whatever. The things I mean, that would appear in your game. And you can flesh out your core game idea and use that as a base to build upon and maybe get a, a following. I mean, at that level, yeah, people are going to notice you using storable assets, but you can replace those assets easily with custom assets once you're at that point. That's awesome. Yeah, I would advise people not to get caught up in making the very expensive choice of focusing on the art first. You need to focus on the core design, and you can do that with boxes. And in, in game development, that's what it's called. It's called a gray box environment. If it's not fun in a gray box environment, then you're not going to put the art in because that's the most expensive part. The most successful being probably that I can think of as Minecraft. Yeah. You know, what a crazy looking game. It looks, I think it looks nasty. My kids love it. Yeah, yeah. It is a massive franchise. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, massive. I remember Billi- when it came out, when it was Alpha. Right? I think I got it for like five bucks when he was first selling it himself. And yeah, back then there was almost no features, but just the idea that you can go and you can build anything you want, like Lego. And then there's the survival aspect in there. It just kicked off. Um, yeah, and it yeah. was just that really basic idea. If you go and present your idea on paper to somebody and say like, yeah, this is my idea, they'll no one, no one cares because they have their own ideas on paper. Now, if you go to, if you go online and say like, hey, this is my game and you have a playable game and people say, oh, that's actually pretty cool. You'll start gathering interest. So you, you really need to understand how to use these engines and how to prototype out your game ideas and, and make it a fun experience at that base level before you can push towards marketing it or even trying to get funding. I hope that didn't bake your noodle too badly and got you fired up for some very interesting technology that'll undoubtedly affect our lives. I just hope we can do it in an environmentally sensitive way. There are so many people struggling right now, and I hope wherever you're listening from around the world that you're safe and healthy. These are strange times, and it's more important than ever to lift each other up. So think about what you can do for your friends or neighbors or just random people you see in the street today. The Ranger Cabin is produced by me, Please connect with me on social media through the links at therangercabin.com. Share your thoughts with me on Instagram and Facebook. Hire me to speak at your organization through LinkedIn. Let's make the world a better place. Keep your fire hot. I'll join you there. I'm Zach White, and this is The Ranger Cabin.